a community resilience handbook for disaster preparedness and management. The second segment is the panel discussion on community-based disaster risk mitigation. The panel discussion will feature some of the globally well-known experts in the field of disaster management. This community resilience handbook for disaster preparedness and management is prepared with inputs from the America with Kerala project with which many of you are familiar. Today is a landmark day. It is the culmination of this campaign, which was jointly organized from June to October 2019 by the US Consulate General in Chennai and the Center for Public Policy Research, CPPR, in Kochi, Kerala, and the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority. This five-month initiative promoted an all-hazards approach, specifically addressing the four phases of a disaster management cycle, including mitigation and prevention, preparedness, response, and recovery. Many of you have been a part of the America with Kerala campaign in different roles, as experts, as resource persons, as project partners, and participants. I want to thank in particular my colleague Biju Kumar at the consulate for his very excellent work on this project and bringing it to fruition. I especially also want to thank our implementing partners at the Center for Public Policy Research and the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority, without whom we could not have completed this project. I also want to thank our panelists in advance for their valuable time and expertise in today's program. A hearty welcome to you all. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Anne Lee Sushadri. She is the Public Affairs Officer at the US Consulate General in Chennai. She previously served as a public affairs officer at the US Consulate General in Toronto, Canada. She has also served overseas in Thailand as the cultural affairs officer and as the American Center Director in New Delhi, India. She served as a vice consul in Chennai during her first overseas assignment with the American Foreign Service. She holds an MA in development communications and a BA in political science. She is the recipient of several State Department honors and is an alumna of the Boren National Security Education Scholarship. Anne is a native of New Hampshire. Anne, may I request you to make remarks and to formally launch the Community Resilience Handbook for Disaster Preparedness and Management. Anne, over to you. Thank you, Malik. Greetings. Wanakam, namaskaram. Dr. Haran, Dr. Tumarakudi, Dr. Grover, Dr. Kuriakos, Dr. Danuraj, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us today as we release the Community Resilience Handbook for Disaster Preparedness. More than ever before, it is important that we recognize the pressing challenges posed by human made and natural disasters around the world. The frequency of disasters have increased in recent decades and they have become more significant, both in terms of magnitude and numbers. Given the huge scale of these disasters, it is more important than ever to look for ways to address these crises and respond in effective, efficient, and comprehensive ways. As the whole world fights COVID-19, building preparedness and resilience has become particularly significant. Let me tell you a little bit about the United States. As you know, our country is vulnerable to natural disasters. In fact, every one of our 50 states is exposed to one or more of a host of hazards to include earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, and wildfires. And I'm sure many Indians watched as wildfires raged in our West just recently, and as hurricanes ravaged the Southeast of our country. According to the US Federal Emergency Management Agency, which we call FEMA, 
the U.S. government responds to at least one natural disaster or emergency each week. In 2019, they responded to over 90 natural disasters. In our country, as in India, the burden for relief falls primarily on state and local governments. However, when needs exceed a state's capacity, the governor may ask for federal assistance. And FEMA, as I mentioned, is the primary agency responsible for coordinating Washington's disaster relief efforts and recovery within the United States. When major disasters strike abroad, the U.S. lends a hand by host country government. This happens primarily through the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID. Here in the Indo-Pacific, we find ourselves in the most disaster-prone region of the world. The death toll far exceeds that from, of other regions in the world when it comes to natural disasters. Now let me come to the America with Kerala project. As my colleague Mulek mentioned earlier, we are releasing the Community Resilience Handbook, which is a key outcome of this project. This project started in response to Kerala's destructive floods of 2018. At that time, the whole world applauded the resilience and the determination with which the government and people of Kerala managed the floods, which I know were the worst in over 100 years. Unfortunately, disaster struck Kerala again with heavy rains and landslides in August 2019. But in the wake of each crisis, the people of Kerala stood together, hand in hand, above considerations of their differences to overcome nature's fury. The international community, including thousands of Americans, stepped up and contributed to disaster relief and reconstruction efforts. The Kerala diaspora population in the United States also contributed. Others include Indian alums of our US government exchange programs, American businesses in Kerala, and American citizens in Kerala were actively involved in recovery and rehabilitation efforts. They leveraged their expertise and leadership in the spirit of volunteerism and giving back to their communities. The America with Kerala project was planned to build. This project was designed to share best practices from the US experience with relevant agencies and stakeholders in Kerala while providing an opportunity for U.S. experts to learn from Kerala's experience managing the flooding. This project involved a series of awareness building events, such as meetings, workshops, media engagements, and interactive programs focused on disaster preparedness, management, and resiliency, and covered three major cities of Kerala. The first round of workshops took place in Trivandrum, and it is there that we ideated the development of a university level disaster management curriculum. We have with us today, Dr. Himanshu Grover from the University of Washington. He was present in that curriculum development workshop and guided our focus group discussions. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Grover. With inputs from that first workshop, Dr. Grover is currently developing a 40 hour elective course that can be incorporated into existing academic programs for universities, autonomous colleges, and other relevant government and non-government agencies. The curriculum that he develops will employ an all hazards approach and it will be broadly applicable beyond even the specific focus of Kerala. This will be, this curriculum will be another concrete outcome of the America with Kerala project. We will present this curriculum to ministries of higher education, state higher education councils, university administrators, disaster management authorities, and others. The second round of America with Kerala Prop workshop took place in Kochi, and that focused on disaster resilient urban development and policy planning. And the third workshop took place in Kozi Kodi, or Calicut, and that focused on community empowerment. That workshop solicited ideas toward the development of a community resource guide that would come out in both English and Malayalam. And I wanna thank Dr. Raj and his team at the Center for Public Policy Research who have done an excellent job in assembling recommendations and key points from those discussions and compiling them in the form of a handbook. This resource guide includes recommendations and inputs from grassroots community leaders who led on the ground disaster 
during the 2018 and 2019 floods in Kerala. It also includes input from US and Indian experts on disaster management and other relevant sources, including the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority and the National Disaster Management Authority. It is my proud privilege to present to all of you this Community Resilience Handbook for Disaster Preparedness and Management. I hope this handbook will come in handy for all of you as you prepare for whatever disasters might lie ahead. And I hope that the outcomes of the Americas with Kerala project will contribute, continue to contribute to the advancement of US-India ties and collaborations in the area of disaster management, management as well as to support the Rebuild Kerala initiative. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for launching that handbook. That's very exciting. I would now like to turn to the second part of today's program, which is a panel discussion. I will go ahead and introduce the panelists and our moderator. The first panelist is Dr. Nevedita Haran, IAS retired. Dr. Haran retired as the additional chief secretary, Department of Home Affairs from the government of Kerala and has served extensively in various capacities with the government of Kerala as well as the government of India. She was also the civil affairs officer for the UN peacekeeping mission in Kosovo for five years. Dr. Haran has worked through the ranks of the Indian Administrative Service, leading home, revenue, land management, energy, and institutional capacity building initiatives in Kerala. She brought up the disaster management department with the Hazard Vulnerability and Risk Assessment Cell and the State Disaster Management Authority in Kerala. She serves as the Honorary Chairperson of the Board of Directors at the Center for Migration and Inclusive Development. Dr. Haran, welcome. Dr. Morali Tumarukudi is currently the Global Chief of Disaster Risk Reduction and Operations at the United Nations Environment Program, UN Environment. He has over 25 years of experience in environment and disaster management around the world. As operations manager for post-conflict and disaster management branch, Dr. Murali coordinated projects ranging from assessment to capacity building and cleanup all over the world. Since 2009, Dr. Morali focuses his work on disaster risk reduction and is engaged in global advocacy for factoring in ecosystems into natural disaster risk reduction strategies. He plays a leading role in the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction. Thank you, sir. We're very grateful you could join us today. Our third panelist is Dr. Sekar Lukos Kuriakos. Dr. Sekar is the member secretary of the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority, ex officio. He contributed to the preparation and completion of Kerala's first disaster management plan in 2016. He led the establishment of the State Emergency Operations Center of KSDMA and is now the head scientist at the Kerala State Emergency Operations Center. In 2018, he participated in the US State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program, an exchange program that was focused on building resilience to environmental challenges. Our fourth panelist is joining us all the way from Seattle, Washington, Dr. Himanshu Grover is the co-director of the Institute for Hazard Mitigation and Planning, the planning at the College of Built Environment at the University of Washington in Seattle. He is also an assistant professor of urban design and planning at the same institution. His research emphasizes place-based planning policies to balance economic, environmental, and social priorities 
to achieve equitable development and to enhance community resilience. He was one of the US experts at the America with Kerala workshops in Trivandrum and Kochi. Dr. Grover, thank you very much for joining us from afar. Finally, our moderator for this session will be Dr. D. Dhanaraj. Dr. Dhanaraj is the chairman of the Board of Trustees and the chief executive of the Center for Public Policy and Research in Kochi, Kerala, of which he is also one of the founding members. He holds a PhD in Science and Humanities from Anna University, an MSc in Physics from Mahatma Gandhi University, and an MA in Political Science from Madras Christian College. His core areas of expertise include urbanization, urban transport and infrastructure, education, health, livelihood, law, and election analysis. Dr. Janaraj will be the moderator of this panel discussion on community-based disaster, disaster risk mitigation. And Dr. Janaraj, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank you very much for your hard work on America with Kerala. You were an excellent partner for the consulate and we were very grateful to work with you. Dr. Janaraj, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Maulik, uh, for the kind words and also uh, giving us this opportunity to work with U.S. Consulate General Chennai uh, uh, to understand the disaster preparedness and management direction in the state of Kerala. Uh, we had uh, excellent time, uh, excellent time working with uh, experts from all over the world. Uh, we had uh, great uh, uh, occasions where uh, we were able to uh, interact uh, with uh, local stakeholders. And uh, all the three workshops that we have conducted, Trivandrum, Kochi, and uh, Kori Kod, uh, it received uh, good attention from all the participants. Uh, they were very much involved. And I, I'm sure the handbook that is released today uh, is a very good you know, outcome, the expected deliverable from this, these workshops that we organized as part of America with Kerala. Uh, I also take this opportunity to, you know, uh, really, I mean, show, show you the audience. Uh, there is a Malayalam version for this book that is released today. Uh, it's called Durandangal Tayaradapulum Neridalum. Uh, this is the Malayalam version. So this will also be available uh, in the public domain. And uh, in fact, uh, we sought guidance and support from Kerala State Disaster Management Authority to prepare this book. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, I don't call it as the expert book. Uh, this is uh, 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 the compilation of the discussions and debates that we had in these three workshops and also in consultation with Disaster Management Authority. So thank you so much uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity. Now coming to the panel discussion today, I think we have got only limited time, uh, about half an hour, and then we'll have a QA and a with the audience person today. Uh, I start with, uh, this is going to be a conversation mode. Uh, so I start uh, by asking a question to Dr. Murali Tumarkudi. Sir, uh, I remember reading uh, your articles. Uh, I remember watching some of your television shows. Uh, in 2016, 17 time, you in fact, uh, uh, you, know, you had a forecast, you know, Kerala is going to have a flood. And uh, sooner than later, Unfortunate for us, it occurred in 2018. And you've seen the pre-flood time, you, you, you also been part of the government missionary advising Kerala government on you know, how to approach, how to uh, uh, prepare for these disasters in future. So from your international experience, I would like to know from you, what has been your experience what is your understanding about the disaster preparedness for the state of Kerala now, having seen two floods and now we are in this pandemic time globally, not only in Kerala. So what is your, what, what is your experience in Kerala working on disaster related issues? Thank you, um, Dr. Thandraj. I want to start by thanking the US um, Consulate General for inviting me to the session, but also even more importantly, supporting Kerala during 
the flood 2018 and also a series of actions which follow from it. The work which Mr. Gro Dr. Grover is now under undertaking, if embedded into our universities, it will have long and lasting impact uh, on it, you know, creating a new generation of students. And I'm also very delighted to be sharing this panel with Dr. Nivedita Piharen, who initiated the work which laid the foundation of the State Disaster Management Authority and with the, Dr. Shekhar, who, with whom I'm almost in a regular touch. So it's indeed really a pleasure to be in this panel. Now coming to your question about Kerala's preparedness, I have been actually been speaking about the possibility of a flood since you know 2013, actually, you know, since the time of the Uttarakhand flood. And it was you know, pretty much obvious that Kerala is going to have a flood. And the boundaries of those floods were actually known, and we had discussed at many levels. We had a major event, I think in 2013, Shekhar can well, um, verify the date, it's called, it was called Surakshayanam. Dr. Nivedita Haran was in charge of the Revenue and Disaster Management um, Department at that time, and we had a global audience of um, you know, experts and audience coming in for that. In 2017, I had an opportunity to talk to the members of the Legislative Assembly in Kerala, and also made the, the same point. But and it is not that the government did not do anything. It, you know, the things were being put in place. The state disaster management authority is very young. And there's also one of the most dynamic and active disaster management authorities, which I'm actually very, very proud of. So the, the things were being put in place, but the events overtook us. And we know what happened. Now, since then, a lot has happened. And you know, I'm probably taking few things out, out of what Shekhar should be saying, but I, I, so therefore I will only say what I have seen and I'm proud of, and Shekhar can elaborate on it. Um, the first and the most important thing which we learned is that during a disaster, it is not the, the UN or the Disaster Management Authority or anybody who save most people. The most people are saved by their family members and their neighbors and their community. So therefore, number one investment has to be in the family and community in terms of raising awareness and capacity. And the State Disaster Management Authority, working with a number of actors, have now put together a massive set of volunteers, almost 300,000, almost one volunteer per 100 population. You know, and they are being trained electronically. Second thing is that every panchayat now have a disaster management plan at a very, very local level. And that I think is going to eventually be tremendously helpful. Thirdly, climate change and disaster management is being integrated into one of the standing items in the local self-government budget. So these three elements, put together on one side, empowering the community with knowledge, with resources, with, with roles, would make significant difference in due course in the, in the landscape of disaster management in Kerala. And I will just conclude by saying that this is indeed the global best practice. You know, we should not be depending upon you know, people coming in by you know, helicopters, or airplanes from outside, we will certainly need them in some context, in some extreme context, some acute situation. But 99.9% .9 of our rescue, of our relief, of our recovery must happen at the local level. And I think Kerala is a good model. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tumarikudi. Uh, in fact, I should also take this opportunity to acknowledge your support and guidance uh, during our Medicare with Kerala workshop. In fact, uh, you had introduced uh, our team to Ms. Karen Rex. Uh, she's also part of uh, uh, UN Risk Reduction 
uh, uh, force. And uh, we had a few meetings with her in Trivandrum when she visited Kerala last year. Uh, so uh, her contribution is also there in this handbook that we released today. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, ma'am, Nivedita, ma'am, uh, I know uh, uh, you had extensively researched on uh, disaster management uh, in India. Uh, you have some publications, you have written books, and uh, you're also the principal secretary of revenue land then disaster management was set up during this during your time. So uh, my question to you is, you know, since Kerala floods in 2018, a lot of talk about development, a lot of, there is a lot of talk about land utilization, a lot of talk about revenue, you know, revenue flow, and then how the development paradigm is in fact resulting in some of the disasters. Uh, could you share some experience? Could you give some insights? Because you had, you were in, uh, in charge of many of these departments in your career. Uh, so could you give some insightful thoughts on this ex uh, discussion that is happening in Kerala? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, taking the cue from uh, Dr. Murali, let me thank the U.S. Consulate uh, and CPPR for inviting me for this uh, discussion. Uh, I would Definitely, it will be a pleasure to share my ideas with uh, all of you. Uh, actually, uh, I was not part of the administration when the Kerala floods of 2018 happened. I had retired before that. Uh, but uh, on what had been done and what was the setup uh, in the disaster management department and how it impacted on governance, let me share a bit of my uh, ideas with you, what happened and what we learned from them. Uh, yes, I was in charge of disaster management in Kerala for almost six and a half years. And, uh, and actually my uh, friends and colleagues used to joke that uh, disaster management, which nobody ever thought is, would be a department had been made into a very glamorous department. So I used to tell them that, look, uh, this is a department which will be probably one of the most important ones in the future. And uh, I think that forecast is coming true. Now, Kerala was one of the first amongst the states to set up its disaster management authority. Uh, Kerala was also very hearteningly one of the first states to reach out to the community level. And uh, the, the uh, you all know that the local bodies are extremely uh, active and strong in Kerala, and that helped. Uh, and that helped, and, and the comparison that I make now seeing other states, I will presently come back to that. But uh, some of the things that uh, I would like to share is that, is the importance of scientific data uh, and empirical data. I think that was one thing that we started doing collecting data, collecting information, analyzing it, and ensuring that policy is made, policy decisions are taken on the basis of such data, which is extremely important. Unless one does that, I think one is kind of groping in the dark. The other thing that uh, I would like to mention is, uh, in, especially in modern times, we are lucky to be living in times where uh, there is a social media, it's, it's such an immense globalization uh, that we can share information so quickly, which was not there a hundred years back when the Spanish flu happened, for instance. But uh, use of ICT and uh, using it, use of social media in an effective manner, uh, we realized how important it was, not only as far as reaching out to the last mile, but also to ensure that we get information from the last mile, which often does not happen. And that was another thing that we learned and we tried to incorporate in all our uh, planning. The other thing that uh, was, is also very important and uh, which um, I need to, I cannot but mention is that any mitigative measure, as Dr. Murali also mentioned, uh, can happen only when it starts at the local level. 
And there, I think uh, we did some good job. And perhaps that has been built upon and, and has been taken much, much ahead. So whether it is uh, empowering them with a knowledge base, whether it is ensuring that the, that the required equipments are available. All these are so important when you come to the level of the village officer and the panchayat, which are the cutting edge level officials and officers in any state in India. And that we managed to do. I remember something, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's still continuing, but uh, we set up these task forces. So at every panchayat level or in, in a group of panchayats, we had these task forces which consisted of eight to 10 persons, local persons who were, who would volunteer to help the other authorities when, uh, when as and when a disaster happened. So we had from the local area, the local headmaster, the schoolmaster, teacher, the, uh, the nurse, the, uh, the local driver, you know, any kind of person, any person who had some kind of a capacity or even if he did not have, he had the desire to do something, we enrolled them into these task forces. And these task forces actually functioned as the eyes and ears of the district collectors in the future. And I was extremely happy to hear when uh, the pandemic struck, uh, a collector who was working with me at that point of time called me up and said, Madam, the task forces we have now revived and they are doing such excellent work and they combined it very well with the ASHA workers. They brought in the ASHA workers and that made it, uh, they become such a potent group to uh, speak to the government, to ensure that they reach out to the people who are actually affected on the ground and to ensure that the words and grievances of these people are reached to the higher levels from where then they can be assisted. The other point I want to mention, which we also learned and which uh, I have to mention is the importance of leadership. And I'm not talking about leadership at a high level. I'm talking about the local level leadership. I have found that wherever the leadership is active, is um, sensitive, the response to disasters has been excellent. And I say that whether it is Bali in uh, Bali village in uh, West Bengal, or Srinagar floods in 2014 in uh, Jammu and Kashmir, wherever the local leaders have stood up and uh, come forward to take the leadership, things have worked well. And many of the cases, very hearteningly, and I, I feel very happy when I see that, it's been the youngsters who have come forward to take the leadership and the lead. The other point I have to mention finally is that something which in the case of Kerala, we are extremely sensitive to and I now try to ensure that other states where I'm involved also uh, get, if not as much, even more sensitiveness, sensitivity towards it, is uh, the, uh, the requirement of uh, agenda balance. Uh, you know, it may sound a bit uh, offhand, but I have seen, and I can at any point give uh, data and information on that, wherever the women come forward and become part of either knowledge building, empowering, or uh, when, when uh, they have to respond to a disaster, the work as, as, has always been extremely effective. And I say this, and I want to end by giving a couple of examples. I remember when, I, when we had gone, I had gone with my team to Bali village. Bali is a small village in uh, uh, Sundarbans in West Bengal. Uh, the woman there asked me that uh, if this kind of a flood that has happened, the cyclone followed by the flood, if this kind of a flood happens again, what will happen? Are we prepared for it? You know, this kind of question was not asked by the, either the panchayat president or the men around. So she was thinking ahead and planning that if I rebuild my house at this point again, at this spot again, will I again be affected by the cyclone and the floods that come with it, the high tides which come with it? And more important, as she was talking to me, her mother-in-law came, came outside from inside the house and asked me, 
look, uh, daughter, you know, something that you need to do is stop people from destroying the mangroves. I was amazed. This kind of a, a reaction, this kind of a response, I had not got it from any of the men with whom we were dealing, we were talking. And finally, in Srinagar, post floods, uh, when we talked to the people there and uh, we were, uh, you know, the reconstruction and all that was happening, uh, it was the woman who asked me that, please make sure that we have an alternate source of employment, alternate source of uh, income. Because once the flood happened, everything was washed away. And for almost two, two and a half years, we had no income. And we were living hand to mouth on the government uh, benefits that were coming. I don't want that to happen again. Please help me to do anything that will help me to earn a living for my family. You know, this kind of response shows that we need to bring the women folk together. We need to ensure that they come and give their responses in a manner that we incorporate that in our policy. And these are some things which in Kerala, I have to say, the, the Kudumbashri group, the Kudumbashri groups, the self-help groups have been extremely, extremely uh, relevant and responsive. And it happened even post floods of 2018. And that is something that we need to really keep in mind when we talk of any response and mitigative measures uh, post disasters. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, uh, that's true for, uh, I mean, the women leaders taking a lead is true in this pandemic time also. I think uh, a lot of studies coming out, whether it's in New Zealand or in Finland, where prime ministers, I mean, women prime ministers are taking a lead uh, in containing this COVID virus. Uh, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll get back to you in the next round about the revenue land, because you also handle those departments, because this is a point of con this, uh, contention in Kerala, you know, in our uh, all the workshops that we had conducted, this was one of the key discussion point. Uh, you know, participants raised this issue. I am sure you will be able to share some insights on those also. Uh, coming to Dr. Grover, uh, Dr. Grover, uh, you were in Kerala uh, for the two workshops, and you also had the opportunity to go to some of the leading universities of Kerala. You interact with students, you interact with the faculty there. And uh, you have that global experience to give some insights. I'm sure, I, I know many students are attending this event now. Uh, many are watching us discussing these issues and some of the faculty members who are present in our workshop, they're also they also joined this uh, pa panel discussion. Uh, you, uh, in a couple of, in these two workshops, in those two workshops that you had attended, you talked about the role of academic institutions. And now Nivedita, I'm also talked about scientific and empirical evidence. And you talked a lot about geospatial data is used in US and your university, your department is uh, taking a lead in those you know, interventions and you are guiding, supporting and advising the local authorities. And uh, since you have Indian origin also, you know, this is the time of <laughs> discussing Indian Americans, you know the capacity of Indian institutions, you know the strength of Indian institutions. and. Uh, you also see in how Kerala is different from the rest of the country in terms of having that collaborative approach at the ground level. So what, and you are now preparing course, uh, you know, we are going to submit it to Kerala's higher education department and ministry. So what do you suggest to the students and professors present here? How could they contribute? How can they contribute to the debates and discussions and even including awareness creation? Other than, in, a, in addition to the scientific and empirical research they could do on disaster, disasters and, you know, probably forecasting, predicting what is going to happen next few years. Thank you, Dhanurad, for your question. Um, let me also thank the hosts for uh, inviting all of us here. I mean, you've assembled a very, very experienced panel, and I'm delighted to share the stage with the other colleagues who, are, who have extensive experience in the field. Um, and Dharaj, like you mentioned, yes, academia does have a large major role to play. Uh, like we've talked about, like uh, Niveda Ma'am was saying about, uh, you know, having risk analysis, having the, generating the scientific data sets, uh, because unless we have true analysis of the risk, we will not be able to respond to it effectively. Uh, and then Dr. Morley was talking about, you know, uh, enhancing uh, capacities at the local level, people being able 
to have the tools and the knowledge and the background to adapt and to respond to these kinds of challenges, uh, academia can play a major role in training, uh, building that capacity. One of the major things that I think, especially in the Indian context, is that we do have, uh, uh, and especially in Kerala, that I saw the amount of civic capacity that you know people came to help out each other and everything, and the way uh, you know the floods uh, impact would have been much worse had the people not kind of come together and responded the way they helped out each other. So I think that is something we can build upon. The problem usually comes is that uh, the, the disaster memory kind of fades away. So these people uh, will kind of forget what they did. And if we don't have few disasters for a few years, people will forget how they responded, things were needed. So in this context, firstly, academia can play as an important role as providing that, you know, documenting the adaptive framework and kind of perpetuating that across generations and across different fields so that everybody kind of understands, see, this is how we did, this is the way it should be done. And this is how we could have saved more lives or saved more property. Another important, I think, the role for academia is to now to start thinking about uh, resilience and you know disaster response in a broader context. It's not a separate academic discipline or a separate field. I mean, come to think of it, disasters are not caused by any kind of extreme natural events. They're caused by humans occupying the space where extreme natural events as it is occur, it's part of the natural cycle. We have infringed upon the natural systems and therefore we're facing, facing the impacts. So especially in academia, we should be able to train students to think beyond just the basic you know, cost benefit analysis, which is in economic terms, but also look at in terms of risk exposure, look at in terms of our environmental services that we impact, how, a certain kind of a development can have impact beyond uh, just the local landscape, how it can you know, result in increased flooding, can increase and increase runoff, can maybe make uh, destabilize the local ecosystem. So uh, those kind of things uh, can really be done. And uh, finally, I think um, the mere fact by discussing and bringing attention to disasters and the challenges that they bring, uh, we are humans are all rational beings. So, I mean, I think people the you know, the people who kind of work in the universities or in the education institutions, the students, just by being aware of the challenges that exist would itself make them kind of, you know, look for avenues and opportunities to build capacity and resilience within their own families and their, you know, extended networks, which will be extremely useful, you know, just they all would know, oh, it can strike anytime. We should have emergency kit. We should have certain, you know, water stored or things like that. So those kind of capacity can go a long way in minimizing the negative impacts of disaster events. Thank you, Dr. Gower. Uh, I'm told that uh, Dr. Kuryakos is on another call. Uh, so uh, by the time he joins back to, uh, to the panel, I'll ask him the question. Uh, uh, Dr. Murali, uh, you know, you have global experience. You've been working in this for, for the last two, three decades now. Uh, what is your advice uh, to the say, state uh, in terms of strengthening our institutions to help them or to you know, equip them in managing and mitigating the disasters? I mean, my question is very particular in terms of, are we still missing any institutional mechanism? Or we, do we need to create more institutional mechanisms? Or the strategy should be to strengthen the existing institutions? Thank you, um, Dr. Tanraj. Um, in my opinion, uh, the institution architecture is already there. And that's really not the main constraint. The information is also very much there. But our main challenge is a lack of focus. We start to think about flood when we have a flood. Then we th start to think of landslide when we have a landslide. And then for you know, months together, we go after it. You have a boat sinking in Thekadi. Next you know, three weeks, 
you are going after every board in the state trying to fix boards. And then you have a firecracker happening in a temple, then three weeks, everyone is after the firecracker. But that's not how you should be doing uh, dealing with disasters. And the, an all hazard approach, which uh, Anne mentioned in the beginning, the hazards are there. Now we have you know, hundreds of high rise buildings coming up in Kerala. The day before yesterday, I was talking with firemen in Kerala. They said only in Kannur and Kasargod they have more than 100 high rise buildings. And in, you know, when I look at Kerala, you know, there will be a fire in a high rise building and many people will die, more than a dozen people will die for sure, because it has happened in Dubai. Grenfell has never happened in London, which you know had fire service for the last 400 years. Um, you know, ha happens in Hong Kong, happened in Mumbai, happened in Coimbatore. There's no reason why it would not happen in Kerala. But we are not there yet. We are just waiting for that to happen. And then, of course, we'll start to pay attention to it. And I, I can name a number of other things, the oil spills, which could happen, you know, along the Kerala coast and so on and so forth. So the key is not to focus attention on the last disaster, but to focus on the next one, the one which is going to come. The, the institutional machinery is all there. The people are there, but spread your eyes, learn from other people's experience at all times. We had two disasters the last two months. We had the ship Wakashio, which hit a reef and broke into two in Mauritius. What do we learn from that? We had a massive explosion in a port in Beirut, which dislocated half a million people out of their house you know, with, within a few minutes. What do we learn from that? So don't wait for those disasters to come to Kerala. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shager? Yes, Dandraj, sir, I am here. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm very okay. sorry that I had to so, wake up. Uh, fine. Uh, so we were, uh, 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 I don't know whether you, you were able to listen to other uh, panelists, uh, but anyway, uh, KSDMA has got a bigger mandate. I mean, uh, I think in our personal conversations also during the last one year, we were discussing the role of KSDMA in uh, the coordination and then effectively implementing some of the systems and practices you know, globally accepted or in the, in the customized uh, version of Kerala. In, in the state of Kerala, uh, that is what KSDMA is expected to do. So my question to you would be on the role of KSDMA in policy making, formulation, coordination among and with the different departments, and effective communication. I, I uh, quite often hear KSDMA uh, comes on radio, television channels discussing, alerting people on you know about the rains and all. So how um, how can we improve from here thank you it's it's pretty a broad question uh, uh, well you have uh, touched upon every aspect of governance which i am uh, rather a novice still with 10 years uh, my first boss and whoever taught me what governance should be is already on the panel so i am uh, less experienced than her to even comment on how we would be working with our tentacles into everything. But what we have done, I will be able to tell you. And probably that's based on what uh, uh, what Madam has set, had set us uh, uh, as, as a path for us to work on. Uh, SDMA uh, works very closely with uh, all the departments in the state and more so since 2016, the, uh, ever since the state disaster management plan was approved. Now, one of the things, one, one example from the plan will tell you how we work with, uh, with, with ensuring disaster risk reduction, which, which is very important, as that we have mentioned landslides uh, a bit a while ago. Uh, in the state plan, it is mentioned that in the high hazard zones of Kerala, you can't have blasting type of quarrying conducted. And this was uh, taken on to the Honorable High Court deliberated upon and in Kerala now the High Court has also decreed that the state plan holds good as a subordinate legislation which cannot be bypassed by any other act or law or rules in the state and that you can't have blasting type of quarrying in high hazard zones of Kerala. 
So this is one intervention that KSDMA did in 2016, and it stands good even now. And it, it has been tested in the, in the judiciary uh, time and again, and we have succeeded in upholding that particular decision. A second initiative that uh, I could mention in terms of how we entered into environmental protection is uh, the Honorable High Court had once suggested to us in a very famous case called T.N. Makar case that KZMA should consider directing the local self-government to ensure that rivulets and streams of Kerala are not obstructed when new buildings are constructed. So under Section 69 of the Disaster Management Act, SDMA in 2017 gave a direction to the local self-government stating that this amendment has to come in the Act. And interestingly, disaster management authorities can direct governments to amend rules or acts to ensure disaster risk reduction. And this is the specific power that was utilized by SDMA. And 2019, Kerala Municipal Building Rules and Kerala uh, Panjaya building rules has this explicitly stated that if you obstruct a, your building shall not obstruct a natural stream or a rivulet and if you do so you are penalized under you will be uh, punishable under section 50 of the disaster management act 51 of the disaster management act so this policy interventions do happen uh, and usually uh, and unfortunately uh, we don't see this interventions coming up big uh, out in public domain uh, discussed by the media because uh, such rules and acts are very dry for public to read and digest. One of the initiatives that uh, Madam herself had uh, chaired and started was the techno-legal regime amendment of the state. Uh, the state's building rules had to be amended to fit to what uh, ARIA committee had recommended uh, way back uh, by the from the NDMA. This amendment is also uh, taken up uh, in, a, in, in a subtle manner into the KMBR and KPBR and nobody has discussed it and nobody does even know that such amendments have come about based on the instructions and uh, deliberations of disaster management authority of the state. Uh, of course, this works need not be uh, um, kind of trumpeted, but of course, this, in, in, in this interventions have happened in the past. Now, there are uh, certain other larger uh, policy level discussions that SDMA triggered in 2018, which uh, Dr. Murli Tumurikudi also had uh, very uh, vehemently supported. And that is with respect to uh, how we should be having a land use uh, act in the state and uh, determining how land is utilized uh, in the different geomorphic units of the state, which is very, uh, very much being discussed. It is part of the Re Rebuild Kerala Development Program. It is uh, very highly uh, uh, cited as a re requirement in the state to ensure uh, DRR in the state. And that Land Use uh, Act would also require land administration to be looked at from a very technical perspective, unlike looked at from a uh, revenue or uh, recordical perspective. It has to go from a perspective of technicalities. It has to go from a perspective of science. And that is already uh, uh, discussed. Already uh, uh, highland area rules are being discussed in the state. It is already in the making. Uh, however, it, it, it's long, long way before an act or a rule is framed and formulated. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the fastest rulemaking process was championed by Dr. Nivedita Priyaran when she was our uh, boss. Uh, that was the River Management Act. Uh, I think it took very limited time. Madam brought in a lot of science into it and it still still holds good and uh, goes on as a Bible for uh, for river management. But such a, such a rule will be required, such an act will be required uh, for land use. And this we have had been campaigning for uh, and this is already put into the Rebuild Kerala Development Plan. Uh, with respect to coordination exercises, our Orange Book is a document, a live document. Uh, it, it gets refined and revised every year since 2019. Uh, and this document covers 33 departments and 44 uh, and eight uh, responding forces as to what are their roles, responsibilities, all this enshrined there. And this year in 2020, uh, the entire monsoon season was handled that way. We have incident response system implemented up to taluk level. 
a lot more training a continued training is required for people to understand outside the brackets of uh, departments and that is what we are attempting to do uh, dr shagar dr shagar can i ask you uh, there is a this is this one question came from uh, the participants to uh, the web benefit uh, ksd may in the recent times uh, uh, decided or this is this is a question i got from uh, get from uh, the audience here uh, the kstma's response to cyclone would be based on states on thumb rule which is slightly different from the sop laid out by imd yes and if that being the case is there any need for a localized sop and response mechanism for disaster management since you mentioned i know your approach i just want to clarify for the benefit of the audience Uh, yes, it is slightly different from what uh, IMD has proposed, and that is based on our lessons in Cyclone Oki. Uh, because when an advisory is issued to fishermen, we now convert it into no go, and that is with respect to the stage of a cyclone formation. So if it is, it has already developed into a low pressure. We don't permit our fisher folks to get out into the sea, and there are certain other changes also that we have adopt, adopted locally. yes local disaster response requires a lot of its own framework in kerala and hence since in 2019 kerala became the only state in the country to have local self government dm plans in all local self governments and this is an approved plan all the local self governments have dm plans now we have uh, got it formulated through a guideline issued by us and extensive training by kila the plans are for the first time made and of course therefore it has its own Uh, problems sdma provided 33 different layers for every panchayats geo spatial layers for all panchayats municipalities and corporations to prepare this and now we are reviewing all of these plans through a set of experts and these plans will be made ready to be revised for the next local self government to come in place so this process is happening parallelly under the rebuild kerala development program and we have technical experts on rural development urban planning architecture hydrology agriculture all of it working on this plan making for the local self government so those plans will feed into the district disaster management plans and the dm plans of the district will pick up those issues that the local self governments can't handle locally and therefore the coordination mechanism is uh, vertically and horizontally linked up earlier it was only vertically down through the revenue system now it is a horizontal wherein the local self governments have also largely come into place and we have extensive training programs for them online through kila which we host uh, we support uh, this is also happening yes it is very much needed that we have a local uh, response plan and that is the orange book i urge everybody to read that it is in malayalam we have made a Malay english copy but then it's it's in malayalam which tells what each has to do including every camp what every camp has to do kerala has four types of camps for covid so that is how it is planned to the last mile sure uh, thank you uh, dr kriya kos uh, i started taking questions from the audience uh, uh, the audience can uh, uh, post their questions on our facebook pages or on the chat box uh this is the question uh, from uh, mr kv thomas to dr grover you talked about uh, collection of empirical scientific data and documentation of disaster experience and memories are vital for disaster management and uh, uh, he shares his experience his experience direct experience in gujarat during the time of gujarat earthquake and the perennial floods in brahmaputra river of assam the community or the people in general are averse to follow up the guidelines to avoid these future disasters how can we tackle those you know, indifferences uh, do we can we learn something from your experience in us it's interesting i just typed a longish response to him but i'll repeat it here it's interesting he mentions the gujarat earthquake because i was also present in gujarat at that time and that even basically changed the direction of my profession at that time i was a uh, uh, director for in for indian national trust art and culture heritage the national heritage division i was in gujarat doing water resource uh, surveys and water resource planning stuff and i experienced it earthquake and then uh, i stayed back to help with relief measures and then i was asked by 
one of the UK foundations to help them prepare plans for redevelopment. And that kind of got me interested in disasters. And I kind of share his frustration that many times, like I was saying, you know, the people have very really short memories. Uh, they forget what happened in the last disaster. So they think of it as an act of, you know, fluke event that happened and we and get a low and they don't want to, and they just let it go. They do not want to work towards it. Like uh, Dr. Morley was saying that, you know, it happens, but we don't want to, and we say, oh yeah, well, let's go for it. And then we forget about it in a few months and then we wait for something else to happen. And I think part of that reason also is because uh, from sociological perspectives, it's easier for us to, kind of forget you know we want to ignore the risks we as human beings we tend to be risk uh, averse in the sense that we kind of ignore risks till the time they don't see us on our face so what we have seen is that knowledge kind of is the key here if people are aware that their risks are real and can have significant negative impacts on them personally they will do the logical and the rational thing is that is listen to measures. The problem happens is that unfortunately, whenever such an event occurs, often it is framed as, oh, it's it's happened because of a natural cause that it's, you know, act of God, we really couldn't do anything about it. So when you are projecting that kind of a, a, a lack of control to a human being, he'll be like, oh yeah, I can't do anything about it. So why should I worry? So whatever somebody is telling me to do to avoid the future disaster won't make any difference. So I think education uh, and you know engaging with the people plays a major role in it where it can be shown where if they understand that their small actions can contribute to reduce losses in the future, that'll be really useful. At the same time, I also feel the government has a duty or rather can play an active role in promoting uh, risk um, reduction behavior because we, you know, they also need to look at it uh, as a profit and loss. The in the U.S. now we have kind of after major surveys and after you know costing like I've talked to you before, we've realized that you know if you put like a dollar in mitigation, you can get six to seven times reduction in actual losses. So if we can start promoting that kind of a risk reduction behavior. It takes a little time. It's a shift in cultural uh, perspective. It's a shift in thinking of disasters as an acts of God or you know some kind of an extreme natural event, as that the humans themselves can are actually uh, causing most of these events. So this combination of community outreach, education, knowledge sharing, along with uh, incentives to do uh, risk reduction measures, I think uh, would certainly uh, promote people. Nobody wants to stand in front of a running bus. If they know that the bus is going to kill you, to kill them, they will move away. Nobody does that. So okay. that's my opinion that's, on it. Yeah, people will yeah. do the right thing as long as they have access to the right knowledge and the resources needed to do the right thing. Uh, Nivedita, ma'am, uh, uh, question for you uh, from Naveen Tony. So his question is, uh, one of the reasons behind 2018 Kerala flood were land use change. Changes in land use, uh, that is change of vegetation to built up areas resulted in encroaching of flood waves into flood plain. The land use planning is one of the risk reduction method. Do you think it is possible for Kerala uh, due to high population density can we have a regulatory mechanism to see, uh, uh, to ensure that the disasters are kept away while we go for optimization of land use? Yeah. Uh, yes, that uh, actually uh, this is, uh, this question is linked to uh, Dr. Dhanraj, your question earlier, which I had failed to answer, my apologies. Uh, about land and uh, the impact and the connectivity between land and disasters. Uh, a land use policy in Kerala, um, something exists, but as was mentioned by Dr. Shekhar, and uh, it is correct, uh, a lot of thinking has been going around it, but nothing has come through. However, uh, if you take specific acts, for instance, the Paddy Land Wetland Act, that's also a land use act. 
it's a kind of land use act where the government regulates which land which wetlands can be converted or not converted which paddy land should not be converted into garden land so it's also a land use act however i think uh, it is very important and this is especially important for present times when the 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 difference between uh, natural disasters and man made disasters has got extremely blurred you see very often when the when a, a natural disaster happens uh, the causes could be very much man made and we know it and therefore there is a need to have a very clear statute where uh, the the use change or the 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 geographical change of a land converting for instance hillocks into plain land which happens willy nilly that should not be permitted but more important are the water bodies and i think dr murili mentioned that uh, the 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 rivulets the ponds the tanks these are all being encroached and filled up although there are acts preventing it so the important point is not just have the act but the second part of it is even more important which is enforce the act enforcement is a big problem even in kerala more so, so madam, kerala. Uh, just to add to that question uh, so uh, in this uh, framework what do you see the role of where, where do you see the role of state government local government community civil society organization in enforcing this you know i'm sure i i, I i'm sure the you know, state can enforce definitely but uh, the participatory role where it comes uh, you see land is a is uh, is a state subject and right. therefore it has to be the the acts and the policies have to come from the government land and water bodies protection however when it comes to enforcement it is true that the unless there is awareness amongst the people and the people realize that if i fill up my paddy land uh, the climate around my area would change uh, the uh, there will be water shortage there'll be drainage problems from my uh, land in future i think that kind of personal personalization of the problem has not happened in kerala perhaps and that is why people fill up their land thinking of a short term gain which is again and that again it's the market forces the price of a garden land is much more than that of a paddy land or a wetland and therefore people try to fill it up and uh, the the disaster the disastrous consequences follow therefore i think it is very important that the state especially in a state like kerala where land is so limited uh, population density is so high it is very important to ensure that the use of land is regulated and is controlled in a manner that uh, in future the future generations do not suffer so thank you ma'am uh, next question goes to dr murali uh, what can kerala learn from amsterdam model of effective flood management also the japanese have a working underground storage system where flood water is channeled and later treated for public use as such infra development suitable for a state like kerala um, that um, the netherlands model of um, flood prevention uh, what is now globally known as the room for the river approach is something which um, the united nations environment program also has been supporting at least for the last 10 years the idea is very basic and very simple that you know as uh, dr grower mentioned most disasters happen because um we our civilization and our activities infrastructure is encroaching on to where the hazards exist the hazards were always there so as also what nevet the um, i mentioned you know if you fill our paddy field naturally the water level will rise and we eliminate these things and allow space for the water space for the water to run through in the river by deepening it by ex- extending it by creating a buffer zone around it and so on so the the method is absolutely valuable especially in place like kutnad for example you know where 
the floods in Kutanadi is completely artificially created uh, by our development in the last 200 years. The, the floods which are now happening in Kochi, and it's going to be of increasing frequency due to climate change in the next 50 years, can never be dealt with an infrastructure development. And, you know, at least a certain part of Kochi will be inhabitable in the, in the next 50 years. So clearly an Amsterdam type approach where they are providing room for the river or making space for water would be the only solution we can have. The infrastructure heavy solution proposed in Tokyo or maintained in Tokyo and also in Malaysia may not be applicable in our case, partly because of the heavy cost involved, partly because of the amount of rainfall we receive in unit time. So I would be looking in that direction for our flooding problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mingli. Uh, next question goes to uh, Dr. Uh, Kuriakos. Uh, uh, this question from Jarin Vargis. What are the challenges of disaster management implementation Kerala in the Kerala context? I think I already responded to it online. Uh, okay. Okay. The, the question is pretty general. The implementation is okay. uh, the the disaster management implementation is not what I think we should be discussing. It's it's more of uh, how do you get get out of these challenges and and get a smooth. Uh, uh, disaster management, uh, mainstreaming happen in the state is what we should be discussing. So challenges are there. Uh, uh, Madam took the initial challenges. Uh, we continued with uh, facing a lot of challenges. We still face. Uh, but then the, the, the point that we want to make here is that we should be relentless in our approach towards uh, pushing this cause. And, and that's the only way forward. So like climate change, disaster management is also looked upon when there are disasters and when it strikes. Kerala is actively discussing this with, with given the number of uh, disasters that it faced. But, uh, but for that, we would still keep it in the backdrop and then we'll take it up when issues come. So that, that is the biggest challenge, to mainstream it, to make it everybody's problem, to make it everybody's uh, discussion agenda when they pro formulate plans and when they take up uh, new projects and developmental projects. That, that's what is the big challenge. And we are relentless in continuing with our efforts. We will face challenges. Uh, we shouldn't be uh, feeling sad about it. There are many challenges. But challenges don't stop anyone. That's what I will assure her. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kudia uh, uh, uh Dr. Murali, can you take one more question before you leave? Uh, uh, yeah, there is one <laughs> very relevant question uh, by Mr. K.V. Thomas. Uh, uh, he is asking about disaster, uh, disaster and environment are interrelated. Do you think whether implementation of Gardel report is a prerequisite to avoid future disasters, especially in the ecologically, ecologically fragile areas of Western Ghat? including some districts of Kerala. Do you feel that the administrative steps are adequate to deal with the issue? What role the community in these areas can play, in, play a constructive role? Thank you um, for this very interesting question. I think it has, you know, for the last three years, it has become an annual routine that we have a flood or a landslide, and then we have a reference to the Gadgil Committee report, as if this report standalone implemented would be a you know silver bullet to solve all of our disaster issues in Kerala. And this is not true. We all agree, and all the panelists have mentioned that good land use planning is fundamental to achieving sustainable disaster risk reduction. And the Gatley Committee report have very good suggestions on it. And certainly it should be implemented. But land use planning is not just limited to the high range. We need Paddy and Wetland Act, as Dr. Nimbatha mentioned, is also a land use act that should be implemented in 
the, the lower lands, the midlands. And we should also implement all the coastal zone regulation act where the Supreme Court has to intervene and dramatically destroy buildings, just probably less than 0.1% of actually the number of buildings which has encroached, just to demonstrate that point. Now the problem is, so we need comprehensive land use regulation covering the hills, high ranges, midland, lowland coastal areas. But our problem is that we are always happy to implement measures when it doesn't cost us anything. So people in the midland are very happy to have the Gadgil Commission report implemented in the hill because it doesn't cost them anything. People in the hill are very happy that the Paddy and Wetland Acts are implemented because that doesn't cost them anything. And people in the highland and the midland are very happy to have the coastal zone regulation. When we were watching those buildings coming down, you know, we were saying, yeah, that's exactly the right thing to do, you know, that they should not be violating the rules. While we were very happily violating our own rules in the Midlands and Highlands. So I will take away this attention from one report and think that as a unique solution for our disaster management problem. We need land use planning and that will affect everybody. And land has become a commodity of trading and that become, go back to its original function as a means of production, means of recreation. And that's when the land price will come down and that's when we will be able to have sustainable land management in Kerala. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murali. I think uh, you uh, want to leave. Uh, uh, so thank you so much uh, for spending time with us, uh, joining from Geneva and uh, giving your, uh, sharing your global experience and expertise in disaster management and mitigation. Thank you so much. And we look forward to you know, uh, getting your advice uh, in, the, in the future also. And also uh, I am sure uh, this project doesn't come to an end with this discussion or release of this handbook. This is a continuous work and all of us present here uh, are determined to continue our good work uh, and uh, getting seeking ex uh, expert opinion from uh, people like you. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on this panel. Yeah. Bye. So uh, my uh, uh, next question goes to Dr. Shagar Kuryakos. The question is very simple. Uh, this is from Priya Pele. She's asking whether COVID-19 uh, be considered under disaster management. Excellent question. Uh, Kerala was the first in the country to notify it as a state-specific disaster. And this we did in February when the rest of the country was still thinking of what to do with it. We started modeling the daily numbers, the spatial spread of it since February. That was when we had initially three cases in Kerala and this SDMA was doing it right from the beginning. And I think in her question, she was also mentioning about uh, whether we have uh, kind of lost grip of what, uh, uh, what we were doing in terms of COVID containment, which is not the case. We are well within the predicted numbers. We started in February, in March, we had a very clear SIR model, uh, which we developed here in house. Uh, and in that model, we had a certain numbers which were projected. We created a business continuity plan and what you uh, in the public domain know as COVID frontline treatment centers where our creation as part of the, uh, the, the, the COVID business continuity plan for the health department of the state in-house again developed by the state disaster management authority. Uh, so yes, COVID is a disaster. It is an attack. It is a disaster which is having uh, kind of cascading consequences on every other disaster that the state is facing. For example, the floods of 2020, we had to create four different types of camps to accommodate four different classes of people who were COVID affected, partially COVID affected, quarantined and general. So all this uh, had to be done. Uh, and I think uh, the impacts of COVID uh, will continue to be felt on a number of uh, disasters, whether natural or human-made, that are in the making for Kerala in the coming months. So yes, COVID is a disaster. We were the first to notify it formally in the country, and we did it in February. 
we continue to operate on emergency mode since then uh, with 24/7 operations from the state emergency operations center uh thank you uh, uh got one question that could be answered by both uh, dr gover and dr uh, priyakos this is about involvement of private players uh public private partnership that we talked a lot uh, and in fact the grower during his presentations those workshops that we had conducted we in fact uh, talked about how market also plays a role in uh, some of these initiatives that university has uh, started uh and i would also hear from dr pidiakos about his experience um, when i talk about private it's not about civil society organizations and community organizations it's a real time market players Uh, so uh, how they are playing a role uh, in kerala so starting with uh, dr grover yeah then raj i was reading that question only and i was thinking you know what to respond to it because it um, i mean one of the things we have to understand that the private players especially the way i guess the question is as is uh, profit uh, the, the private players whose primary motive is profit making uh i do know there are a number of legislations and i guess guidance documents in india that talk about corporate social responsibility and promote socially responsible behavior so that seems to be one of those uh, easier nexus where you can uh ask corporates to kind of play a leading role and work uh, with government agencies and the community to reduce uh, their risk exposure at the same time there is also this growing field uh, i don't know if any of you have seen that even the us out of uh, our uh, silicon valley now there are five or six new startups that are talking about disaster apps disaster preparedness apps so what i'm trying to say is that there is a lot of profit in actually uh, private players coming into the field and promoting disaster awareness and promoting mitigation and pro- and actually working with the community to develop more uh, or to strengthen the existing response systems so that would be one of the uh, you know places where private players can kind of work with the government fill in the gap another one is uh, larger bigger players uh, actually can uh, help the government in terms of generating data sets uh, sharing their expertise providing their risk assessment the risk models and also of course the insurance industry also can play a major role there uh so there are a variety of ways and there are a variety of examples uh, available um, across the world for example here um, microsoft and amazon and all each one of them have their own risk management divisions which work with the local government in trying to pass on the information of any kind of impending disaster like for wildfires we have a number of private agencies uh, circulating the you know the warnings guidance documents and using their own networks so think of it this way if larger corporates can actually have a tie up with the government where once a warning is issued they can kind of through sms send it to all their employees that itself serves a big purpose that a significant proportion of the population gets it uh, so yeah so there are a variety of ways to do it i think uh, it just needs a little bit of innovation and thinking out of the box and uh, the results can be quite can be really good thank you Doc, thank you dr grover and uh, dr kriyakos how are we involving them what uh, are the plans thank you and kerala is also known for this question is also very important in terms in the context of kerala because we have startup missions we have so many you know uh, i mean there are so many students are participating in this program so what do you what do you like to tell them i i'll uh, start with our experience much before floods in 2012 the Uh, when madam was our uh, leader we conducted one of india's largest disaster management conferences called suraksha anam 2012 that is actually uh, what set the ball rolling for creating sdma as you see it now which is discussed also um, in that conference uh, from that conference onwards we have had active participation of private sector uh the conference itself received a lot of financial and uh and aid in kind from private sector we had mobilized over uh, 1.5 crores at that point of time itself for the conduct of a conference in itself so you can imagine that the private sector of kerala is very keen to involve with uh, state disaster management authority in various aspects of course 
given the lack of a framework uh, to engage them, there are issues that we do see. Today also, in, in, in parallelly, I was discussing on the same issue of private sector engagement uh, with the state planning board, uh, where we were discussing on how to formulate that. Uh, now, in 2018 floods, the private sector of the state came together under the, uh, under the Council for Industries and benevolently supported the Rebuild Kerala initiative, uh, not just by financial aid, but also bringing in innovative uh, technological solutions. For example, um, new and alternate types of housing, which, require, which are less reliant on natural resources for construction. Uh, energy efficient lighting. Uh, they, they even supported to the extent of funding uh, of providing uh, you know, entire electrification support to houses across Kerala in many, many parts. Uh, more interestingly, uh, and this is something that I uh, for the first time saw officially recorded anywhere, they instituted a business to government scheme of support. So, for example, when a household uh, has lost all its assets in a natural hazard, uh, like in the 2018 or 19 floods, and they wanted to buy a television or an electric fan or a light, the companies came and said that we will offer it to them in a business to government rate. Thereby, a lot of taxation, a lot of profit got offset, and uh, people were able to come up with. Uh, come up with small amounts of money and procure all those essential items that they lost. To support that, we also facilitated a soft loan through Kudumbasri, our women's self-help group, famous women's self-help group, wherein the families were given about one lakh soft loan to procure uh, essential items from notified shops, which agreed for a business to government uh, rate of providing assistance. Uh, from the startups, Tremendous support in the beginning days of COVID. Uh, I had about 20 startup uh, startup leaders the, or the CEOs of startup companies sitting here in the SDMA, crunching data on hospitals. Now, if you go to our infrastructure database, you will see all hospitals, a lot of infrastructure enlisted, mapped and provided as Excel sheets in public domain. All this was done by startups. They're uh, people who came and worked with us. In 2018 floods, we had a startup company working with us on locating people in, disrupt, uh, in, in distress and providing locations based on those distress calls back to the rescue teams. So startup engagement is pretty broad in, in, in SDMA. We work on a daily basis with uh, volunteers from the startup uh, companies. They do it voluntarily. Some are paid, some are not paid. Uh, some projects are funded. Uh, and recently, with the support of World Bank, we also did a tech emerge project. Uh, we have just shortlisted a company on data analytics uh, who would be helping us to establish an online platform for uh, big data uh, handling in the, the data that we had in 2018 floods and 19 floods are huge. And that data needs to be crunched and brought into one platform. So that is also being supported uh, through uh, young startup companies, private companies. So I'm we sure are not averse very, to private companies. So we very, very encouraging uh, news for all the students attending this uh, panel discussion. Uh, with that, we are coming to the end of the panel discussion. Before we leave, uh, I would uh, I'll request uh, Nivedita, ma'am, to uh, share, uh, summarize the discussion and uh, share her thoughts about the future of disaster management in the state of Kerala. Thank you. Uh, I think we had some excellent uh, sharing of ideas and uh, listening to each other. Uh, I think the, the biggest takeaways for me uh, is are the first, um, the importance of ensuring that we are better prepared and ensuring that it doesn't stop with uh, just having our plans and SOPs, but ensuring that they are actually taken down to the grassroots level. Second, uh, we got some excellent uh, ideas that uh, Dr. Professor Grover shared about what is happening in other countries. Uh, and I think there is never a time when we should stop learning from others. Uh, we don't just learn and copy, but we also adapt, which is extremely important. 
And in the case of India, that is uh, uh, extremely important also because uh, it's, it's a kind of takeoff from the last question that was there about the involvement of private sector. Uh, since I get this opportunity, let me mention, uh, I am involved with a couple of uh, small and uh, micro uh, enterprises and I'm mentoring them. And at least three of them have, during this pandemic period, have diversified into areas where they are involved in supplies, supplies to public health. And you see, that is the way that a startup should function. It should be able to uh, take up things as the situation demands. And that is a lesson that we, I think, are taking away from here. Also, finally, the importance of uh, the local bodies and ensuring that we that we encourage them to innovate to uh, to come up with ideas which are local specific is again so important and in that context uh, I have to end by saying that uh, protecting our lands protecting our water bodies are so very important especially if we want to ensure in a state like Kerala that uh, we are uh, more resilient to our floods and we are able to face them in a manner that will lead to lesser loss to life and property, which is extremely important because every life lost is a disaster, is a, is a, is a shame, which should not happen. And uh, I think that is the main takeaways that I take away from here, uh, Professor Dhanaraj. And finally, thank you for having me. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think with that not uh, every life lost is a disaster, it's a shame. I think, I think we should work together towards uh, uh, reducing the uh, risks and also the loss of lives uh, in our times. Uh, uh, this is a very wonderful panel discussion. Thank you so much for uh, participating in this panel discussion. Thank you so much, Nivedi uh, uh, ma'am. You took time to uh, actively involve this uh, panel discussion. Dr. Grover is uh, late night there, <laughs> and then you, you are so happy to uh, join and share your thoughts. And Dr. Priyakos, I know you, it's a very, you know, I, I always wonder, you know, how do you find time for all these meetings? Because I think Kerala is facing disasters or all. some, you know, emergencies every day. So you are responsible for, you know, decision making and you know, active uh, involvement in all the bureaucratic decisions or political leadership decisions that is taken. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't take all the questions. There are so many questions. In fact, the chat box is flooded with questions. Uh, for the paucity of the time, um, but we will continue this conversation on our Facebook page. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, with that, I hand over the proceedings, rest of the uh, meeting proceedings to Maulik. Maulik. Well, thank you, Dr. Danaraj. Thank you for leading that panel discussion and for all the question and answers. Um, I want to thank your team at the Center for Public Policy Research who worked so hard with my colleagues on this project. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And like I said in the beginning, this is a, a day of culmination with the release of the handbook. So congratulations, job well done. Um, I want to give a, a quick shout out to my colleagues on the digital team at the consulate. They work very hard behind the scenes to make this program and many others in this virtual time uh, a success. So I want to in particular thank my colleagues uh, at the consulate for their hard work on our digital program. Hello, uh, are we missing link? Uh, uh, Maulik? Yeah, we lost Maulik. Okay. I'm happy to from the consulate if that's what's needed. Uh, I, I echo Maulik's thanks to all of you, uh, especially those who joined us from, from different countries and different time zones. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion and as you, um, have seen in the chat box all of this uh, all these discussions are captured both on facebook and our youtube channel so thank you very much and uh, 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 my colleague neetu nair will extend a lot of thanks good afternoon everyone uh, the current pandemic that is raging across the world is yet another reminder that we need to seriously intensify the commitment on disaster management and preparedness and also work towards an all hazards approach. 
So on behalf of the Center for Public Policy Research and the US Consulate General in Chennai, let me take this opportunity to thank all the speakers who shared their experience and expertise here today. Thank you, Ms. Anne Lee Sheshadri, Public Affairs Officer, US Consulate General for uh, releasing the Community Resilience Handbook and enlightening the audience with the highs and lows of the America with Kerala project. Uh, thank you. Uh, this, uh, this particular handbook is available on CPPR's website now, and also the link has been shared on the chat box, so you can download it there. Also, Dr. Murli Tamarikudi, Chief of Disaster Risk Reduction at the United Nations Environment Pro Program. Thank you, sir, for sharing the international and local experience of disaster management, as well as the need for an all hazards approach, uh, not just focus on the last disaster. So, and more importantly, thank you for repeatedly stressing on the need for the diversity in this panel. Thank you, Dr. Nivedita Harun, who's a retired IAS officer, former additional chief secretary, Department of Home Affairs, and currently the chairperson uh, of the board of directors at Center for Migration and Inclusive Development. Thank you for such an interesting articulation of the experience of working within the government system in building up a community resilience. Also, your observations on the involvement of women leaders uh, comes as a very crucial point in this discussion. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Shekhar Lukas Kuriakos, Member Secretary, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority. Uh, both KSDMA and Dr. Shekhar has been a guiding force for the entire America with Kerala project. Thank you, sir, not only for sharing your experience today, but also for your guidance over the entire course of last year. Uh, without which a, dis dis a discussion for us on the disaster management uh, landscape in Kerala would not have been complete. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Dr. Himanshu Grover, co-director, Institute for Hazard Mitigation and Planning, uh, University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, right from the first workshop in June 2019 till today, uh, your expertise has added immense value to this project. I remember how clearly and uh, how patiently you explained the disaster management cycle and the all hazards approach to a wide variety of audiences. So uh, we are immensely grateful for your support, sir. I also ex extend my gratitude to Dr. Dhanuraj who moderated the session and brought together perspectives in these different perspectives in a meaningful way. So he has been a guiding force and a mentor to the CPPR team who is working on the project. So throughout the America with Kerala project, uh, we had the support of many organizations uh, and academic institutions who partnered with us to make this a grand success. Many of them are here with us today. Uh, various departments of the Kerala government, the Kudumba Sri Mission, ASAP, district administrations of Trivandrum, Kochi and Kodikod, Chamber of Commerce in Kochi and Calicut, civil society organizations like Tunnel Palliative Care, Pratidwani, and more, most importantly, uh, academic institutions like the JDT Islam Group of Institutions, St. Teresa's College, Kochi, Kerala University, Bharat Madha College, and various media houses. We thank each of you for your immense support throughout the America with Kerala project. Also, I extend my warm gratitude to Mr. Malik Barkana, Cultural Affairs Officer, US Consulate General, and Lauren Lovelace from the consulate. They have been a constant source of encouragement for each of our team members working behind the scenes for this project. Also, at this juncture, I cannot thank enough the US consulate team who has worked with us, Biju, Ratna, Chitra, Venkatesh, Nelson, DP, Suman. I, I'm taking out these names because we have had so many individual interactions with you and each of them have been a personal learning experience for all of us. Last but not the least, I thank our team at CPPR who has stood behind the scenes contributing brick by brick to this project. So if we have taken a step towards creating a more resilient community, it is all these efforts put together. Thank you all for being of such a wonderful audience and engaging so well during this conversation. Thank you and have a good day.